So, without further ado, what is a probability measure? A probability measure is a set function. Now, there are two words here, set and function. Okay. You're all, of course, very familiar with the idea of a function. f of x, a real-valued function of a real variable. Long tradition and training in the calculus has made us very comfortable with the idea of functions. Well, the probability measure is a function, but it is not a common or garden variety function. It's a function whose arguments are sets. This function takes events, measurable sets, and maps each measurable set or event to a real number. The domain of this particular function is the family of sets of interest to us, the algebra of sets f. And to each set, this function p assigns a real value. Uh, this is a little, oh, troubling. This is not the usual friendly kind of function we're familiar with. But nonetheless, this kind of codification of, of abstraction will, as we shall see shortly, capture the essential idea of chance. Bear in mind that we want to assign or ascribe an idea of chance to events which are sets, and we are then inevitably led to a process which to sets assigns numbers, in other words, to a set function. Well, what kinds of properties should this set function P have? Well, we draw from our experience and we saw the three fundamental properties. First, the set function P of A, in words, the probability of the event A, should represent something like the frequency that A occurs in many independent trials of that experiment. But frequencies are positive, and therefore, inevitably, we will want all our probabilities to be strictly non-negative. This is the fundamental positivity property. If you ever encounter, due to a trite algebraic error, a negative probability, you pause, step back, and say, well, this is a nonsense, and go back and find the error. The second of the basic axioms is that of normalization. The performance of a Gedanken experiment, our thought experiment, always results in an outcome, in a sample point from the sample space. And therefore, the entire sample space is a certain event, and therefore, it is natural to ascribe to it the probability of 1. Now, I should point out that choosing 1 for the normalization is a matter of convenience it is a matter of definition. This is not something which is given from above. It is not something which is inevitable. In fact, in ordinary language, we use a rather different normalization. Can you think of what it is? If you th said 100, of course you're absolutely right. We talk about the chances of the weather turning, the chances of rain being 30%. The chances of a flood being 2%. The chances of this in terms of percentages. Implicit in this, in this kind of language is that the certain thing has got a 100% chance, the normalization is 100. But of course, while talking about the subject, we will frequently lapse into colloquial language and use words like percentages. But when we do calculations, we will always revert to the basic normalization of a unit. The sample space has got unit probability. Now, these two axioms are natural, inevitable perhaps. The third axiom pays for all. This is the fundamental additivity axiom. Pause and write it down. This is important. It is hard to overstate the importance of additivity in mathematics. Additivity is one of the glorious pillars which supports the entire foundation. It looks trite. 
It is a statement of addition. And you will say, fairly enough, well, we did addition in elementary school. How can this be so complex, so subtle? But this has got ramifications far beyond what it appears. And we will see this repeatedly through the course. This is one of the cornerstone principles, not only of probability, but of all of mathematics. The idea of additivity. How does it manifest itself in a chance setting? Well, I should give you a word in notation. Additivity is going to concern either finite collections or countably infinite collections. So when I write a set like AJ with J running over positive integers, I could mean a finite set or a countably infinite set with J running over all the natural numbers or perhaps all the integers. Now, say that such a collection, either finite or countably infinite, is pairwise disjoint. If any two sets in this collection are disjoint, share no elements. Now, if you start with a collection of pairwise disjoint sets, and you say, well, let us form a new event by taking the union of all of these sets. In other words, the union is a new event which occurs if A1 occurs, or A2 occurs, or A3 occurs, and so on. The principle of additivity says the probability of a union of disjoint sets is a sum of the constituent probabilities. In the notation, when I put in a J without adornment in the subscript, it means let J run over all the possibilities in the problem at hand. So in this case, J is going to run through a finite number of possibilities or possibly a countably infinite number of possibilities. Imagine an abstract sample space. Here's a Venn diagram. Imagine a finite or possibly a countable infinite number of events, subsets in this sample space. And suppose they are mutually exclusive. No two of them overlap. You could have a finite number, let's say two of them, in which case we are looking at A1 and A2. And the union of A1 and A2 has got a probability, which is the sum of the probabilities of A1 and A2. This is what additivity tells us. The whole is equal to the sum of the constituent parts. You could have a finite number, say n disjoint sets. The probability of the union is the sum of those n individual probabilities. You could have a countably infinite number of these AJs. And they're all disjoint, mutually exclusive. The probability of a countably infinite union of these AJs is a series, a sum of the individual probabilities. Now, this extension to countable infinities is, as I said, prudent. It turns out to be vital. What it does for us at a high level is it allows us to proceed from finite sums, which are completely unexceptionable, to series. And it permits a continuity, a limiting argument to be made seamlessly. Now, this is the kind of progression that one has seen in basic calculus when one talks about series which converge. It is in that context that these countable infinities become useful.